It is a gathering of mountaineering legends. In the village of Kumjung, high in the Himalaya, family and friends have come to honour the legacy of Edmund Hillary. It's so good to see you. There's George Band, one of the last surviving members of the 1953 expedition that conquered Everest. What's it like coming back here? <laughs> We're so glad you Very, very special. I mean, this guy is truly amazing. He was the youngest on the 1953 expedition, one of the strongest. This is Peter Hillary, Edmund Hillary's son and a world-class mountaineer and explorer in his own right. He's climbed Everest twice. This is the real thing. Also arriving by helicopter is Sir Edmund's second wife and widow, Lady June Hillary. Namaste. She now heads the New Zealand-based charity he founded, the Himalayan Trust. Does it feel like you're coming home almost? Yes, it does exactly feel like coming home. Yeah. Yes, it looks so good. Everything's looking good. There's um, the statue of Dan there. Yeah. They've come here for the 50th anniversary of what many regard as Hillary's greatest achievement. He's here in spirit. <laughs> Not mountaineering, but a program of building schools and hospitals for the local Sherpa people. This is the first school the Himalayan Trust built in 1961. It was the start of a campaign that transformed this once impoverished region. But beneath the bonhomie, there's tension. Lady Hillary and her stepson Peter no longer speak. It's fairly obvious today there is something of a rift between you and Peter Hillary. I don't uh, want to discuss that. No. Uh, Peter Hillary created a rift between him, him and me. Well, let's see what this place is like now, Mike. Uh, well, they've, they've developed it. It's changed a bit, eh? Yeah. And some of Edmund Hillary's oldest friends, like his climbing protege, Mike Gill, accused June of forcing them out of the charity they helped build. June is a person who likes to have just a small group around her and, and she prefers her family to be around her. Mm. So neither of you are on the board anymore, are you? I was, uh, I, I was on the council, but I was actually expelled from the council. I have the yeah. distinction of being the only person to have been expelled. It's not just an issue of family infighting. It goes to the heart of how Sir Edmund's work will continue. June wants to keep it all in the Everest region, even though it's now the richest part of Nepal. We only have the money to do that, so that's our philosophy that we keep it and do it properly. And I think it's working too. Peter wants to take it to the valleys beyond the Sherpas, where people are still as poor as when his father first came here. These areas supply the low paid and mostly uneducated porters who labor for the wealthy Sherpa owned businesses. They spend several months each year carrying back-breaking loads up and down the tourist trail. They're almost living in the 13th century. I mean, they don't have money. They're subsistence farmers. A lot of the challenges that, that people had back in uh, Europe centuries ago are their challenges. The news reached London in a message to the Times. The world heard of Hillary's triumph on the day of Queen Elizabeth's coronation. It marked him indelibly as a hero of the empire. It said that Mr. E.P. Hillary, a New Zealander, and Tenzing Bhutia, a Sherpa, had reached the summit last Friday, May 29th. Message added, all is well. He could have retired to enjoy his fame, Instead, he spent his life repaying the Sherpas. They're descendants of Tibetans who migrated to Nepal centuries ago in search of grazing land. While they'd saved many climbers' lives, their own lives were hard and short. Ed always told the story about, in 1960, he asked the Sherpa Serta, he said, if we could do something for you, what would it be? And he thought it would be health. But the Surda said, please give us a school in Kumjong. 
and six months later, Ed gave them the school in Kumjung, of which we are here for the 50th Jubilee. Well, we came in 1963 and Ed had built his second and third schools. Mike and, um, Gill and John McKinnon, both doctors, became part of Sir Edmund's mission. As young climbers, they would come to this region to tackle new peaks, but also help build and run the schools and hospitals. That was a pretty small price to pay, I mean, to have a trip to the Himalayas, climb mountains and build a bridge or build a school or something, which is the type of expedition that Ed ran. Yeah. It was no hardship, believe me. One school followed another, giving Sherpa children a chance their parents never had. On behalf of the Himalayan Trust and all those who have helped uh, build this uh, school, I have much pleasure now in uh, declaring the school open. It was like a calling, a calling to go and help people who he really enjoyed being with and who had helped him on his expeditions. And I think he just found that every time he got another proposal for a little school over on that side of the valley or a water system down there and he could see how difficult it was for the local people, he really wanted to help and that's, that's what he did. Da Futi was among the first girls to attend the Kumjung school. Not everyone approved. My mother said, oh, stay home, work for the family. But my father, he has been to the Darjeeling, he has been to Kathmandu, so he knows the value of education. So he insists me to go to school. And was it exciting to be one of the first girls to go? Um, well, no, because uh, lots of boys always teach us, teases us. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Today, Darfuti runs a popular lodge in the Himalayan village of Lukla. In my hotel, I do all the work, serving like a waiter. I do the cleaning up and look in the kitchen. And also, shippers work hard, foreigners like us, because we work hard. Her life story is typical of many Sherpas. Her father summited Everest with an Indian expedition in 1965, but died in a climbing accident six years later. School was the family's salvation. She not only learned skills to run a successful business, but ensured her children had the best education possible. One of her sons now works for a five-star hotel in Sydney. If I haven't been educated, maybe I might be a Portugal. <laughs> Who knows? Yacht driver, woman. A photo of Sir Edmund has pride of place in her lodge. He became a kind of surrogate father. When uh, I was a little girl, he used to come sometimes twice a year and we used to sing and dance for him. But I didn't know that he's so famous. So you just thought he was an ordinary man uh, who built yeah, the school? Yeah, I just thought he was an ordinary man. <laughs> What sort of man was he? What's your recollection of him? Ah, he's very huge and humble, gentle, and he is very, very nice man. Do you miss him? Ah, yes. I miss him. Sorry. Education wasn't the only way he changed lives. Once the school building was underway, Sir Edmund turned his attention to the chronic illnesses in the Sherpa community. People weren't just dying from diseases like smallpox, children were being born with mental retardation, known as cretinism, because of poor diet. One of the, the really interesting early things was the iodine deficiency in the area, because being a high mountain area, there's no iodine in the water. And every woman had a, uh, a big, lumpy goiter in her throat. And what you didn't realise um, just passing through was the number of cretins that were being born. It was the Australians who discovered that if you inject iodised oil into an arm, it will release oil for the next five years. And John worked on this a lot when he first came, and we got rid of all the goiters and all the cretins. Not a single kid has been born in this area uh, with cretinism since that happened. The hospital he built at Kunde, the region's first, is now run by a local Sherpa, Dr Kami Temba. 
Without the nearby Kumjung school, his life would have taken a very different turn. My family had a, quite a big yak farm. So my uh, primary uh, occupation would be yak herder. Instead, he walked five hours a day to attend the school. The Himalayan Trust later sent him to Fiji to complete his medical qualifications. The great thing has been that people who've gone through Ed's education system have become the staff at the hospital. That's, that's really the marvellous thing, mm. wouldn't you agree? Absolutely, absolutely. In all, the project has built 27 schools, two fully equipped hospitals and a network of health clinics. Many of the Sherpa graduates are now some of Nepal's most successful professionals and business people. And the project has changed the region forever. The airstrip Sedman Hillary built to bring in supplies now also bring trekkers and tourists. We used to run away when we see foreigners. <laughs> Uh, now the place is full of them. <laughs> <laughs> One foreigner who everyone recognises right, is, is Peter Hillary. Oh, my God, you've moved fast. You, you're a day well, behind us. Every so often I like to have a bit of a workout, so I've, I've come up this hill as fast as I could. Uh -huh. You don't feel the altitude, I suppose. Oh, no, you feel the altitude, but I'm feeling good. So 47 yeah. minutes up the Nanchi Hill. <laughs> every season he leads treks here to raise money for the communities. I mean, I first came here when I was just 11 years old, mm -hmm. and there were simple little wooden huts, dry stone walls, mm -hmm. smoke everywhere. There wasn't a single corrugated iron roof. Yeah. Now look at it. It really is Namchi Bazaar. You can yeah. buy anything here. Internet, cappuccinos, Wi-Fi. Oh, look, that's right. You know, check on your email and so on. It really has developed. You know, it's sort of a, a Sherpa Swiss village in a way. Yeah, yeah. Someone coming through with a rather large <laughs> so load. It's got relatively wealthy these days. It has, but you only have to turn around and go south below Lookler Airstrip, which yeah. was a little airstrip that Dad built, mm -hmm. and you go back into the old Nepal. He and his sisters, Sarah and Belinda, spent much of their childhood working on their father's projects with their mother, Louise. They're wonderful memories, and the best part of it was because we were a family, mum, dad and the kids, all together, participating and being involved in it. What better thing could you do with your family than bundle them all up and come to a place like this and just go walking and visit different peoples and, and have this incredible adventure together, the whole family? But in 1975 came a terrible tragedy. We were thinking it was going to be the adventure of a lifetime. We were going to build a new hospital. We were going to live here for a year. We were going to learn the language. We, you know, we were really going to do all sorts of things that we'd, we'd wanted to do. Instead, Louise Hillary and her younger daughter, Belinda, Peter's baby sister, were killed in a light plane crash on their way to join Sir Edmund. It's hard to imagine how devastating they must have been. You know, I think even sitting here now as a 56-year-old man, in a way, I, I still struggle to come to terms with that. Experiences like that are so shattering that I think you just have to learn to live with it. I don't think it's really a case of ever really shedding the pain. Did your father ever shed the pain? You know, it's hard to say, but I, I actually don't know if he ever did. But he continued the work, later describing it as more satisfying than climbing Everest. The public never saw the turmoil he went through. He wondered a lot about, you know, why was he so driven to do it? And then I think he suddenly realised that um, if, if he didn't carry on and complete Parflu Hospital and some of the other projects, in some ways it was just going to make it worse. On one hand, it gave him the focus to see that through and maybe sort of divert some of the pain that he was feeling, but also sort of to make sense and to make good of what had happened. After many years of solitude, Sir Edmund found solace in June Mulgrew, the widow of a friend and fellow climber. They married in 1989 and she became a partner in his work, 
joining him on the few high altitude visits he could make as he struggled with declining health. At Pafra Hospital, I remember painting the whole kitchen inside the cupboards, and it was awful. The paint was awful, <laughs> and the brushes were hard to work with, and it seemed to be never ending. It was, we've really, really been hands on. But as June's influence grew, Peter Hillary's diminished. Much to the dismay of many longtime trust workers like Jim Strang. I'm really disappointed that Peter is not acknowledged, you know, within the New Zealand Himalayan Trust. Yeah. yeah. What, what's behind all that? Oh, well, I think it's family dynamics. Yeah. Which is disappointing. I don't think it needs to be that way. Jim Strang has run a successful teacher training program here since 1997. It shows teachers, many of whom only have high school diplomas, how to bring lessons to life rather than relying on rote learning. It's an ongoing need and I believe without that we're actually shortchanging the teachers. To just build the schools and then not resource them with training or with with um, other things is, is, is false. On. But in 2004, the trust, now dominated by June, suddenly stopped funding it. In the box. In the box. We did it for, I think it was six years, four years, I can't remember now. Um, and they felt that that was good enough. It's the same as the forestry. We did that for a certain time. I think that's the way to do aid, really. I just thought, this is incredible. We've got uh, this remarkable person, a team of teachers, um, a great need. By now, Peter was working with a new organisation, the Australian Himalayan Foundation. It took over the training programme, which is now seen as a model for the Nepali education system. <laughs> Lowly paid teachers are given concentrated training by experienced Australian, New Zealand and Nepali teachers on how to get the best out of their students. This is hot water or cold water? That's your hot water now. When you kept hot water, did your balloon blow? Yes or no? Yes. yes. It's the first teacher training Namdu has ever had. The training is being really, really effective on me. It's helping me a lot. So you think you'll be a better teacher now? Yeah, I think I'll be more a better teacher. <laughs> OK, going well, man. That's good. Yeah. The Australian Himalayan Foundation picked up the whole mantle and extended it. That's the big thing. Now we've gone from 70 schools here to almost 300 schools. So it's always wonderful to get back going... Working outside his father's charity, Peter Hillary has continued to carry on his work, raising funds for projects, monitoring their success, and visiting old family friends, Anguli. like his surrogate Sherpa aunt, Anduli. Oh, Anduli, namaste, so good to see you. He's been staying in her house since 1966. These are yetis on the mountains, just coming <laughs> over the ridgeline and looking... I love coming up here, I love catching up with a lot of the local people, and I like seeing the results. He saw, he saw them up at Gokyo Lake. He's seen a yeti. He's seen a yeti. You know, to see some of the schools that we've just recently visited, the improvement in the, in the teaching standards, those sort of things, it's been very gratifying. Until recently, the rift with his stepmother was a closely guarded secret. But late last year, he discovered June was planning to auction his father's old watches, which Peter says had been left to him and his sister. I was absolutely astounded. You know, I, I felt that there were some things that were very special. Ed Hillary, I mean, OK, he's my father, but he was a pretty special man. He did a lot of very special things. You know, it wasn't just a, a, a family issue. It wasn't just for, like, Sarah and I to say, well, these things belong to us and we'll do with them as we wish. It's not like that. Education is number one. They won a High Court injunction to stop the sale. June Hillary remains furious at what happened, but reluctant to speak publicly. But that's nothing to do with the Himalayan Trust. Absolutely nothing to do with it, except that I wanted to sell them to give the money to the Himalayan Trust. And uh, he didn't like that. Oh, he gave them to me to do that, and I haven't been allowed to do it. But I don't want that on. But, you know, obviously we have to ask about it, but... Um... Well, why? 
Because it's been in the public in the public arena, it's been a matter of some controversy. Um, in Australia. In Australia and in, obviously in New it's Zealand. Disgraceful. Do you and June talk anymore? No, I mean, look, I've I've tried, but she doesn't want to talk. But you're about to come face to face at this yeah, commemoration. Yeah, um, but you know, there, there won't be any conversation. I'm sure. You know, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to request arm because. There's... And so it was at the 50th anniversary. Both were welcomed with affection by the Sherpa people, but neither even made eye contact as they sat just inches apart. Despite the obvious tension, all insist it doesn't affect the mission to carry on with Sir Edmund's work. It's three years now, three and a half years since it died, and uh, it's going very well. I'm really thrilled with how well it's going. The reality is that the work does go on, despite sort of conflicts that happen. And Peter Hillary is determined to extend the work beyond the relatively well-off Sherpa region. You don't have to go far to see the difference in how people live. Well, today we're heading to a very different part of the Himalaya where the tourists and trekkers don't go. It's just on the edge of the horizon there, but it's like going back 50 years. We flew past the majestic peaks of Everest and Armour Dublin, then turned south to the town of Parflu. This is where many treks begin. But just across the valley from here is the village of Lura, where trekkers never come. The poverty is wrenching. Saki Sherpa is illiterate and lives in this one-bedroom house with her son Lakpa, the last of five children. Edmund Hillary gave some help here, but the area is far from transformed. Twenty-three years ago, the New Zealand Himalayan Trust built some classrooms. Today, the Australian Himalayan Foundation trains the teachers. Parents like Saki believes that's what's making a difference. This is a country now of 28 million people living in a tiny mountainous parcel of land. You know, the average income is $200 a year or really whatever it is. It's a, an extremely poor country. Um, there, there's a lot to do. The hope of Sir Edmund's supporters is that the true spirit of his vision continues. The remarkable, selfless contribution to a people who became his extended family. The opportunity to go trekking in the hills with Ed and to build a school and to actually see the way in which that type of minimal aid, really, I mean, not much money type aid, can actually transform lives. And so we've built up huge friendships, not only between people like ourselves, but also with the local people. And so to go to a function like we've been for the last few days and to you know, have people come up crying, oh, God, it makes me cry. Mm. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I just think he has got good heart. 50 years ago, there were no schools, no education, no health, so no water supplies. So when he saw all this, I think he said, oh, well, this is the thing that I should do. So he did it. <laughs> 